All right. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Lee Allison. I'm the principal investigator on the NSF EarthCube Test Enterprise Governance Project, and we've been carrying out a year-long uh, effort here for community engagement uh, to help develop a governing structure to coordinate uh, uh, different elements of the EarthCube community. And this is the third uh, version of this webinar we've offered out there uh, to explain the governing structure that's been put forward by the community and we're finalizing our arrangements with the National Science Foundation to actually set up this demonstration governance and put it in place over the next couple of months. And our goal today is walk through and explain to you uh, what the community's designed here, what the opportunities are to participate in it, what roles you can play, and how to get involved, and uh, the plans of what we hope to achieve over the next year. So we've, we've been waiting a couple of minutes here. Uh, there's been a number of people who are in the midst of signing in, logging in, so we're giving them uh, time to get going. So the plan for today is to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the background of, uh, of how we got to where we're going and, and the role the community's played in here. Look at the structure that the community's put together and talk about how you can get involved in the opportunities. Uh, that should take uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, and then uh, we hope to have uh, questions uh, from you in the audience, the participants here. What we would uh, propose that you do is in the chat window uh, online is go ahead and type your questions in. And our plan is to go through the full presentation and then turn and we'll start going through the questions that are in the chat box. Uh, and what we found on previous uh, webinars, there's been quite a few of them. So hopefully as we've tweaked our presentation here, we've been able to incorporate uh, some of the answers that people have asked or questions people have asked before. So we may be able to resolve some things that, that have popped up in previous calls. Uh, and then, then we'll open it up to uh, oral questions, anybody who's on the line who wants to ask a question. And, and I'm hoping that we'll have time to, uh, to take all of those on. We are recording this, I believe. Uh, Rachel Black is here with me. He, she's one of our uh, project coordinators, and she's going to be monitoring the chat box, uh, things coming along. But we are recording this. All the slides are up on the earthcube.org website, so those are all available. and You can come back and look at those. And uh, if we run out of time, which I, I don't think we will, but if we do, uh, we're available to follow up with you offline and, and try to answer any questions you have. So uh, what, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So as I mentioned, the, the uh, agenda today, we wanted to explain a little bit about EarthCube. Uh, we've had a significant number of people on the previous webinars who are new to EarthCube, who had heard a little bit about it but really didn't know a lot. Uh, how we got to the all-hands meeting that was held in June in Washington, D.C., where we finalized these plans, uh, recommendations to NSF on how to set up a governing structure and put this demonstration governance in place over the next year and test it out. Uh, and what the charges and the expectations are to the various committees, teams, and leadership council that the communities recommended uh, be built into this structure. And then over the next couple of months, how you get involved, uh, deadlines, roles that you can play, and what we're going to try to achieve with this governing body. And then we hope the last half of this, uh, this hour-long segment we'll be able to uh, answer your questions. So if you're not uh, familiar with EarthCube, it's an initiative that's coming out of the uh, Geosciences Directorate at NSF in partnership with the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. And it's built around the Cyber Infrastructure for 21st Century Initiative, which is an NSF-wide uh, program. And the Earth Sciences, excuse me, uh, Geosciences stepped forward and said, we'd like to be the test bed. Let's see if the Geosciences uh, can lead NSF forward. We think our community is ready technically and culturally to take this on and recognizing that we've got a wide variety of challenges in the geosciences that a cyber infrastructure could help uh, meet. So EarthCube is cyber infrastructure for the geosciences within the um, uh, cyber infrastructure for 21st century 
uh, vision. And so the goal is to try to create a community-driven cyber infrastructure rather than building technology and hoping the scientists come to it. Let's have one that the scientists define what needs to be done and how we need to be able to work together and design the technology around that to meet the scientists' needs. And the goal is to help scientists have better data discovery and knowledge management um, across different disciplines and around the world and enable us to do things that we've never been able to do before by achieving interoperability, the ability to bring different data sets together from different areas and integrate them seamlessly on our desktops or on our laptops uh, and be able to do science that we've never even thought was possible before. So this started about three years ago with a dear colleague letter from the geosciences uh, director uh, at NSF. There were two charrettes or these community meetings subsequently those led to uh, a request for white papers and expressions of interest in participating, and, and NSF was overwhelmed with hundreds of these two-page two uh, white papers coming forward, and it led to uh, NSF reaching out and forming uh, 18 or so different uh, working groups that developed then over a period of a year a series of roadmaps and concept designs on how this ought to uh, work together to to bring forward a, uh, an integrated cyber infrastructure. Subsequently, there's been 27 end-user workshops set up in, in different domains across the geosciences. Uh, I think there's one left, maybe two more left, uh, one of them being held just in the next week or so. Um, space physics, I think it is, it's meeting. Um, uh, but 27 workshops that have been held so far bringing anywhere from 25 to as many as 75 people together from each community. And they put together an assessment of what's the status of each community, what are their needs, uh, what kind of capabilities would like, they like to develop. These then ended up with NSF using the feedback from the community and all of these roadmaps and concepts design, putting out the first uh, $12 million or so of building blocks, research coordination networks and conceptual design awards. There's a second round with a similar amount of money that are in negotiation right now. Uh, proposals were received back in March. They've been reviewed and NSF is in the midst of awarding those and negotiating the final terms. So uh, we've got another dozen or so projects we expect to be added to the EarthQ portfolio here in the very near future. But we've got a dozen projects moving forward right now. And one of them is a governance project to see if we can build community-driven uh, governance design, and that means working with the community. So we run the website for EarthCube as part of this project and also have been out with exhibit booths at, at many of the national uh, meetings for oceans, atmospheres, earth science, polar programs to spread the word and get community engagement on what this should look like. Every one of the funded projects has a web page on the earthcube.org website and a workspace for project members to work together. So by coming to the EarthCube website, you can find all of the projects that are funded within EarthCube currently, and as the new ones get up and running, we'll be adding them as well. In this project, to talk to the community about how we work together, how we communicate, how we coordinate, how we collaborate, we held uh, four community-wide workshops starting back in January one for data facilities, another for the EarthCube funded projects, a third that aimed at the technical side, the IT, information technology, computer science, information science, and the free and open source software community uh, in March. And then uh, a, a fairly large one bringing together representatives from those 27 or so end user workshops, plus professional societies, and particularly um, uh, end users uh, who are really the target audience for NSF in this project. And as a result of those workshops, there were representatives from each of those who then came forward at a follow-up uh, uh, workshop where we tried to synthesize the input uh, from all of these different stakeholder groups. That led to the development of a series of what we call strategic pathway exercises. And you can see a picture of, of one of these 
uh, tabletop kinds of exercises that were online where people would come in and say, okay, if this kind of decision was made, if this kind of organization was placed, if this kind of opportunity uh, was available, how would I respond to it? And depending on that response, it led to a variety of other possible outcomes. So we had hundreds of people involved in running through these exercises. Uh, a smaller group then came in and did a very intense, very uh, extensive review of the charter that was developed uh, out of these assembly workshops of what a governing structure should look like. And they tore that apart line by line, item by item, and provided feedback and found weak points, found gaps, uh, found uh, areas where there were questions that be needed to be resolved. And uh, another 50 plus people participated in reviewing the whole framework of how do you set up governance. So we had a very diverse set of participants at various levels of involvement uh, coming back and doing a crowdsourcing basically on what we had developed through all of these workshops and providing feedback to us. Uh, all of this then was brought together uh, late uh, in June in Washington. We had over 150 people attending representing a great variety of, of academic institutions, various organizations, federal agencies, uh, nonprofits, broke up into quite a few uh, working sessions. We had posters, uh, some uh, uh, plenary types of uh, presentations helping put it all in, in perspective. These were Many of these were generated by the participants. I think 30-plus uh, uh, breakout sessions generated from the participants of what we needed to, to uh, deal with. And as a result of that, we came out with a uh, fairly well-defined governing structure that we are now recommending to NSF. We're in the final stages of uh, uh, reviewing that with NSF. But the goal is to set up this test governance demonstration phase over the next year. And the big charge given to this community-led governing structure is to see if we can find convergence on what an Earth Cube architecture should look like so that it is uh, set up and designed to meet scientists' needs and requirements. And so that is probably the biggest challenge uh, bring, uh, put, being put forth into this governing structure. It's also to test how effective this demonstration governance works in achieving these goals and meeting community needs. And so uh, this really is a, a test. It's going to be an agile process of looking at uh, this governing process. Does it work? What do we need to change? Uh, what can we do to make it work more effectively? So uh, there's a call for uh, participation that's been underway. The first two webinars were held uh, in the middle of July. Uh, the one today is probably the last of the series that we're going to offer. Uh, and we're bringing forward the initial charter, submitted it to NSF based on the input and, uh, and the community uh, resolution of it uh, at the All Hands meeting in June. And uh, here over the next few weeks, we're going to be setting up and organizing meetings of uh, standing committees of teams that are really the lifeblood of the Earth Cube organization. And it's where the community is going to be able to come together and make policies, uh, implement decisions, and bring them forward and to try to achieve uh, the goals laid out. So through this fall, we expect to have the working meetings where we're setting up the standing committees, the working teams, uh, develop our leadership council, and start addressing the big questions. How do we make sure that we've got a structure that's going to work and, and achieve the goals of the community? In January, we expect to get back together with small groups, uh, representatives from the various committees and teams and from the leadership council that the community elects, representatives from the community. So we're expecting 25 or 30 people to get together for uh, two to three days and examine how well is this working, uh, what do we still need to do, what changes do we need to make, uh, what, what's additional that we hadn't thought about, and make whatever adjustments are needed. And then over the next six months, come back and uh, implement these things pretty quickly so that by next June, we hope that we're going to have a draft architecture coming out of this community process, one that's designed by the community and intended to uh, achieve community goals, and that we've tested this governing structure. Is this an effective tool for the community to continue working with? If we're successful, uh, NSF has indicated their desire 
then to take the results of this demonstration phase, analyze what's worked, uh, what needs to be changed, and put together a funding solicitation for a possible five to ten year long implementation of the EarthCube uh, organization with a decade long goal of actually building and deploying an effective cyber infrastructure that's meeting scientists' needs. So this is the uh, 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 somewhat of a diagrammatic chart showing the elements of the EarthCube enterprise demonstration governance that the community designed. At the bottom in blue, the idea is that everybody who wants to be a member of EarthCube can be a member. All you need to do is sign up online and indicate who you are and provide contact information. Uh, I'm going to move uh, past the, the gray teams for a moment and move up to take a look at the, the orange areas here, the standing committees. These are really the guts of the organization. Um, anyone can join either one of the architecture technology committee or the science committee. And you can see that uh, under, under each of those, we're going to have, uh, under the science committee, the science projects that are funded by EarthCube right now will form a subgroup within that science committee. Same way that the building blocks, concept design awards funded by NSF under the uh, EarthCube umbrella right now will work under the architecture technology uh, committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the right is the Council of Data Facilities. And this is a group that came together during our very first workshop, and it was representatives from dozens of different data facilities and data centers that are either funded by NSF or other federal agencies or our actual federal data facilities. And they came together recognizing a tremendous need and value of their collaborating, working together, sharing standards and protocols, and figuring out how they can um, uh, work more collaboratively. And so they have formed a very formal uh, organization with a, a well-developed charter, and they are open right now to charter membership, but it's aimed at institutions. Everything else in EarthCube governance right now is aimed at individuals. So the other standing committees are, and all membership in EarthCube otherwise, are individuals who join up and say, I want to participate. No cost, just sign up. You can join either one of the standing committees the Council of Data Facilities, you actually have to be a data facility and agree to some terms of the charter. And so they operate a little bit differently. But together, these three standing committees will each elect their own leadership. Uh, they're developing their own guidelines, bylaws, uh, how they're going to operate. Uh, and they're fairly, uh, for the two uh, uh, standing committees, they're, they're fairly loosely defined right now as the groups develop over time, they have the ability to get something more elaborate or more formal if they want. Uh, but each of these standing committees will uh, appoint, elect somebody to serve on a leadership council. And so that will be three of the leadership council members. There's five additional seats that are at large that will be elected by the community. And the plan right now is to try to designate uh, one for each of the broad elements of the NSF uh, stakeholder community. So one from the IT, computer science side, one from solid earth science, one from ocean science, one from atmosphere science, and one from polar programs, and representing five at-large members for eight members on the leadership council. A separate chair of the leadership council will be elected directly by EarthCube members. And where we stand right now is that um, the first three Stand, or leadership council members will come out of the standing committees. They will then develop um, a uh, process for nominations and election of the at-large members and the chair. So we hope that they will be in place by mid to late September. Uh, they'll be putting process together, and by the time of the AGU fall meeting, just as a rough guideline, that we will have established a nomination process and a, an election process and have that open to the community to fill the remaining uh, membership on the Leadership Council. Let me step back now. I jumped over the two gray boxes here for engagement team and liaison team, where the standing committees are ex expected to be the policymaking arms uh, of uh, EarthCube. The engagement team and liaison teams are the implementation areas. And again, they're open to participation by anybody from the community, but their jobs are going to be carrying out the, uh, the policies adopted by the standing committees and the leadership council. 
and all of the standing committees and teams are going to have staff support provided by the office, which is shown to the right in light gray. Um, we here at the Arizona Geological Survey and the University of Arizona, which run the project, have some people that have been working for the past year to help organize all of the events, work with the, uh, the uh, assembly teams, work with the workshops, and those staff will be assigned to provide staff support to the standing committees, to the, to the teams, uh, to the leadership council, and there will be a full-time paid position that will be opening here very, very shortly to be the office manager, the program manager of that office. And uh, we're looking for somebody full-time for the next year. It's possible it could be extended uh, perhaps six months beyond that year uh, as we move uh, into a transition phase from the demonstration governance into a, an actual uh, longer-term governing body. But that'll be a paid position that we're going to be opening. We're finishing up the, the, uh, the job description of that right now. But that staff in the office, shown in light gray on the right, will be there to carry out the work of the Leadership Council and the elected uh, members and of the standing committees made up of the community. You also see uh, some work groups scattered through here in different colors. Uh, members of EarthCube can form a working group, make a proposal to uh, establish it. There's a very short uh, uh, form to fill out with a specific requirement of what deliverables, what challenge are you trying to meet, what deliverables do you propose, what's your timeline, what budget do you need, what resources do you need to achieve that goal. Uh, these can be initiated by three or more members of the community, by a standing committee, or by a leadership council. So the different colors are intended to show working groups established uh, at any one of these levels, and then they will be reporting back through uh, the standing committees to help provide guidance for setting policy and making decisions Then that may be then directed to the teams to carry out. At the bottom also, you see uh, down in the members the special interest group. Uh, any three people, I think it is, uh, can form a special interest group. These don't require any... Um, formal uh, plan of operation. The difference is there's not going to be an allocation necessarily of staff support or of funding uh, to help the special interest groups. But a place, it may be a place for people who have an interest to get together and start talking about things that might eventually lead into a working group with a more formal uh, plan of action, uh, deliverables, and budget assigned to it. Or just groups that want to get together and say, let's just stay in touch. There's some issues that we want to kind of collaborate on. So now we're showing more of the organizational chart that gives you a better idea of just how these pieces fit together. So again, everything is driven by the community here, shown in blue at the bottom. They, community members form the standing committees, uh, make the elections uh, of, of leadership within a, each of these standing committees. They form the working groups. The standing committees appoint members to the leadership council which will be the, uh, the decision-making body uh, across uh, all of EarthCube. Uh, they, on the right then, can pass uh, direction down to the engagement team and liaison team. And I apologize, I realize I didn't explain in detail what those two teams do. The engagement team is really uh, trying to work with the broad EarthCube community or potential EarthCube community. Uh, we've seen that EarthCube up to this point has been heavily dominated by the more tech-savvy members of the community or the, the IT uh, community, but also among the end users, those people who are probably already using a lot of uh, cyber infrastructure capabilities. We want to make sure that we fully engage with the broad geosciences communities, and the engagement team is tasked to do that. The liaison team is tasked to reach outside the EarthCube community. We realize that uh, even though the NSF initiative is, is big, it's bold, there's similar initiatives going on in other scientific domains, across other federal agencies, across the private sector, at the international level, and there's huge, huge activities and resources being invested. We need to make sure that we're tapped into that. So the liaison team is tasked to try to identify where are those efforts and those bodies and those individuals outside of the EarthCube community that we need to touch base with and coordinate with, learn from, share, 
uh, maybe leverage resources and make sure that we're, we're, we're not duplicating efforts and we're, we're drawing from the best of the best wherever it's going on around the world. So that's their task. Um, so where we stand now is um, EarthCube is open for business. We are soliciting uh, people to sign up, become a member of EarthCube, indicate if you have interest in participating in one of the science uh, or technology standing committees. If you're a data facility, they are calling for, it's an open membership right now, charter members to come in and join the Council of Data Facilities. You could start setting up an interest group. We're aware of quite a few teams that are working right now, developing working group proposals that as soon as the EarthCube uh, governance is in place, they will be bringing forward proposals uh, for specific tasks and uh, deliverables and budgets to, to carry those out. Uh, people are signing up to participate in the liaison and engagement teams. We've also had a number of people indicate their interest in participating, running for office on the Leadership Council. And so some of those details will be coming out. But let us know now, uh, get involved, because in the next few weeks, the first organizational meetings of the standing committees are going to be uh, uh, set up and announced. We're trying to make sure that you don't have to attend a single online virtual meeting to be able to participate. And the details of that are being worked right out uh, now to make sure that you have an opportunity uh, to participate, whether or not you're able to sit in on a particular webinar, for instance. And so those details will be coming forward now. But we want to make sure, express your interest now so we can make sure that we can follow up with you, let you know of something that's coming up that you've expressed interest in participating. So there are some priority issues that the community put together at the assembly workshop uh, in May and then that were uh, prioritized uh, at the all-hands meeting in June in Washington, that the Leadership Council needs to have a more defined scope and vision for EarthCube. EarthCube deliberately up till now has been very uh, broadly defined with the goal of not trying to put a box around what it may be, to leave it open enough so that the community could come forward and help shape what that vision and what that scope may be without a predetermined uh, constraint on it. And I think we're now at the point where things are converging and the Leadership Council is asked to define this a little more uh, in, in greater detail now that the community's had uh, 10 months or so to provide so much feedback. The standing committees, uh, one big challenge for the Science Standing Committee is to get engaged with the, uh, with the work groups, uh, show how the structure of the work groups will fit in with the scientific community. And there was a specific recommendation for a use case, a test case to start out to see how this committee could work and how inter interact with the community. And that is trying to develop a policy or better strategy on data management plans, the kinds of things that NSF and more agencies, funding agencies are requiring now. So use that as a way of testing out the process, figuring out what more we need to do to get this thing up and running and make it effective. Similarly, the Technology and Architecture Standing Committee has this big challenge of trying to find community consensus on an architecture. And they have to work very closely with the Science Committee and with the Council of Data Facilities in making sure that the architecture is one that meets the need of the existing communities. And so that there's test beds for different components that are already being built within EarthCube among a variety of different projects. Bring those in and see how they would fit into this architecture or architectures, how they would interact with different pieces that are being brought forward from a wide variety of projects. Uh, additional priority issues, the Council of Data Facilities is going to be looking at how they can develop shared services among all the different data providers and how they link together. The liaison team has been asked to look at all the national activities, the international activities. There's a tremendous number of consortia already out there working in cyber infrastructure, and many of them in the geosciences. We need to touch base with those and make sure that we're aware of them, they're aware of what we're doing, and see how we can leverage uh, those. And there's some of that activity already going on. Uh, a lot of EarthCube members were involved in the ESIP summer meeting uh, just last month in Colorado and had EarthCube uh, working groups, the informal working groups meeting during the ESIP meeting, and there was a lot of cross-fertilization. The engagement team, we uh, want to work with the science community, uh, the broad geoscience 
uh, community and make sure that the, the work groups are being coordinated uh, across the, uh, the EarthCube initiative and that they're really bringing forward the, the, uh, the desires of the scientific community and sharing some of the success stories that are coming out of EarthCube projects already. We're already seeing some really exciting results uh, out of some of the initial building blocks and how scientists are taking those and, and using them uh, in the field and in the lab. And we want to bring them back to show how EarthCube uh, can be replicated and scaled up to work uh, in, with everybody. So the charge to our standing committees, uh, early on they've got to uh, develop their own internal decision-making process, how they're going to operate. They've been given some very broad guidelines, generally things such as, uh, you know, it's open to everyone to be a member. Uh, there's a few basics, but each committee has the ability to help define their own uh, bylaws and operating uh, workflow procedures and how they're going to uh, work together internally. The staff is available to work with them and help guide that process along. And uh, uh, they're going to be putting together some initial working groups or reviewing some of the proposals for working groups, make sure that we don't have uh, 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 conflicts or duplication or if there's uh, different uh, approaches that different work groups are doing that might uh, 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 provide some, um, some challenges, how to reconcile the differences between what working groups may be proposing. They have to select their leadership to serve on the leadership council and who their representatives are going to be, how they're going to decide what priority issues are coming forward from working groups, recommendations from the leadership council, ideas coming back from the teams. How are they going to decide what their priorities are and how to do those? And then, uh, how do we coordinate across the different committees? We hope that there will be, and we intend that there will be uh, a lot of cross-fertilization so that the technology folks and the scientists are working together in a collaborative manner to design an Earth Cube that meets everybody's needs and uh, uh, is going to achieve our long-term goals. Our teams have been charged with similar goals. Uh, work out their own decision-making process, uh, they're going to have non-voting representatives on the leadership council. So to make sure that they're sitting there to understand the decisions that are coming out, the, the directions that are being given to the teams and what the real intents are. Uh, how they determine their priorities with the resources that are available and implement the recommendations and, and directions from, from the committees and from the leadership council. Um, the Leadership Council, uh, again, has their own decision-making process. There's a draft charter in place. Uh, they get to finalize that and, and, and develop it with the community structure that they want to, to rep be representative and responsive to the community. Uh, they're going to uh, hopefully early on be able to uh, develop some coordination mechanisms across the different communities, different committees, and different teams, and how these different funded projects coming out of EarthCube are going to work and how they relate to the standing committees. And that's going to be a big challenge. Uh, they get to approve proposals for working groups and allocate budgets to those, including ones that come forward from standing committees. Uh, they may set up their own working groups where they see that there's a gap or a critical need, and if it hasn't come forward uh, from a community group, uh, they, they get to establish those and, and allocate the resources. And again, they're going to be the final uh, decider on setting priorities and determining that vision and scope and where the resources are going to go. So uh, the chair will be elected by the community. And in the first couple of months of setting up uh, the, the governing body, uh, the initial leadership council will be setting up that uh, process for nominations, uh, and for voting, uh, selecting a chair from the general membership. But in that first, first phase here, uh, the recommendation is let's get a chair that may be elected from the leadership or that is proposed to be elected directly from the remainder of the leadership council. Uh, the concern is um, that we're still adding members. It's going to be uh, a long process here while we reach out to the community and get broad representation uh, within EarthCube, uh, get the election process in place, uh, so the thought is now let's get uh, a full leadership council in and let them choose a, a chair from among their membership in the first phase of this. And then as the community gets more involved, we get this in place, 
then we go up and open it up for a chair who can be elected directly by the community. So people have asked, what are the expectations? Well, if you want to just be a, a participant in EarthCube, stay active of what's going on and see opportunities, uh, uh, let your voice be heard. Uh, leadership might be two to three hours per month right now, as we're expecting on the various uh, committees or teams. If you just want to sit on, on conference calls or participate in some of the web forums and dialogues, perhaps one to three hours per month. Uh, more than that, if you want to, if you get active in some of the discussions and some of the decision-making processes going on. We expect that we're going to have three or four people from each of the committees and teams meeting. Uh, initially, the plan was January 5th to 6th in Washington. We're now relooking at, we may be changing the dates on that because there's conflicts with some other national meetings. So we may be pushing that back at least a couple of weeks so that we don't have a conflict with some of our core stakeholders. But we think three or four people from each committee, from each team, and the Leadership Council meeting in, uh, in this check and adjust period to say, how's the process working? What do we need to, uh, to check, to adjust, uh, modify to make sure that we're successful? So where we stand right now is the first meetings of the standing committees are being scheduled, and we're going to get those out to you, we hope, uh, very shortly so that you can plan ahead. We hope by the uh, uh, end of August that we will have facilitated meetings of the standing committees and the teams that they'll be able to uh, uh, bring forward nominations for people who want to serve as leadership council members from these committees uh, and then hold the election of those people, get them in place by mid-September, and have the organization up and running by the beginning of October. With the office staff in place, uh, the initial uh, leadership council, and then after October 1st, they will be uh, finalizing more of the leadership functions and charters and priorities, setting up the election process for the remaining at-large members. And do we have any questions uh, in the chat box to begin with? Yes, we do. And so I think we have several. And I okay. think the best way to do this is I'm just going to read through the ones that have come in the chat already and let Lee answer them. So the first question is from Joan Aaron. And her question is, um, she says that Brand Neiman and I set up a Birds of a Feather meeting on EarthCube data science publications at the All Hands meeting. Um, there is definite interest, and we would like to define how to connect this activity with EarthCube. Okay. I could see two ways right now, and we've got our whole uh, uh, office team in here with us, so hopefully they will correct me and or help augment my, que uh, my answers here. But um, one, uh, you could form a special interest group, and that's very informal, and you can, and we have special interest groups. We have a couple dozen of them already now up uh, with space uh, on the on the earthcube.org website. Uh, but if, if this is a new one, you're encouraged to go ahead and set one up. Um, and it's very, uh, very minimal requirements uh, to do that. And it's, it, it's a way to uh, get some space on the website, set up a forum. Uh, you can uh, use the, the webinar capabilities. And it gives you a chance to talk and start working together as a community. If you're beyond that, if you think you have a specific target, a deliverable, a goal, a challenge that you want to meet, that you've got a team together, you could start forming um, and inf form an informal group right now to propose a work group. The advantage of a work group, and there's disadvantages too, I'll, I'll mention, the advantage is um, you can have uh, more support, staff support, logistical support. You may have a budget to help put travel together for some meetings or, or do some other things. Uh, the downside is you have to write a, uh, a short but formal proposal with a deadline, uh, deliverables, identify who's going to be responsible, and you'll have to run that uh, either through a standing committee or uh, run it through the leadership council. The work groups will not be approved until the leadership council and the organization is in place. We can't do that in the governance project. We're, we're the community engagement folks. So uh, we know of at least three different groups right now that have formed together working on draft work group proposals so that when the governance is in place, they can deliver that. So, okay. I know there's a lot of other questions, so maybe we probably ought to move on. What's the next one, yep. Rachel? The next one is a clarification on one of the slides, and that was the 
timeline slide where it said February to June 2015, um, develop, an archi develop architecture framework. And the clarification question is, does this refer to cyber infrastructure architecture framework or the governance architecture framework? Uh, good point. That's the cyber infrastructure framework, a system uh, architecture, uh, design architecture, system design. There's a number of different names floating for it. But uh, we hope the committees uh, will start working on that immediately uh, come October 1st. But we also realize there's going to be some time setting up procedures, protocols, and, uh, and forming the, the work groups on that. And we'll be adjusting that in January. Uh, and see how the initial work goes. But the intent is we hope we'll have things worked out enough so that, that that will be the time when we're really looking at the technical design rather than the governance design. But good point. Okay. And then the next one is about this slide that said at large um, representation will be selected from the G across the Geosciences Directorate. What about representation from the Cyber Directorate? That's a good point. That's a good point. And this is uh, this is one where we're still in in discussion. Um, and you bring up a good point. Uh, the original proposal was four at large members, but in further discussion with community, with our advisory committee, with uh, uh, operations group, with NSF, uh, the question came up: How do we make sure that that EarthCube is really driven by the science community? And so the recommendation that's that's come out. Um, in the discussions has been, we'll designate uh, the four at-large members to be representing each of the uh, geoscience communities. But in doing so, then that may not cover uh, the technical side of things. The standing technical standing committee will certainly be bringing somebody forward from the cyber side, and the Council of Data Facilities would most likely have somebody who's more on the technical side but it will really dominate. So that's a point that still has to be resolved. So thanks for bringing that forward. It's one that we're in the midst of conversation. And, and um, thank you for catching that. Um, and then the next one is, can a standing committee create and approve, create or approve a new working group? Or is that a function of the leadership council? Um, and is, is the process that a standing committee recommends and the leadership council approves? I think it's more the latter. Um, the idea is that the leadership council will have control over the budget. And because the working groups may have budgets assigned to them, uh, and also because different standing committees may set up different working groups or, or propose them or recommend them, the leadership council needs to make sure that there's not duplication or if there's uh, you know, some, some proposals that are at odds with each other reconcile that. Uh, so the final approval is put into the hands of the Leadership Council. The standing committees can initiate a work group proposal, could recommend one that comes from the community, uh, could comment on, on those, uh, but the final decision is intended to be made by the Leadership Council. Um, okay, then another one about the um, note that the Leadership Council Chair will be elected by membership. And the question here is, what is a member? Is this an organization or an individual? Uh, right now, membership is individuals in EarthCube. Now, having said that, the Council of Data Facilities is different. And that's a council of facilities or centers. It's institutional rather than individuals. And they have a very formal charter that they've been developing over the last several months, and they've defined that membership very clearly. We, the uh, assembly workshop uh, that met in uh, May, you know, addressed this topic specifically, and, and we brought it back to them, noting that uh, their recommendations were that EarthCube is made up of individuals. Uh, but that we did have this one standing committee that was made up of institutions. And they, they were very explicit in acknowledging that and saying, no, we think this is the way it, it should be established. So anybody can sign up to be a member, and members get to vote on the general chair of the, uh, of the leadership, in the Leadership Council. I'm wondering, as I said that, though, is the question, do, do institutions that are in the Council of Data Facilities 
do they have the same vote as a member, as an individual? And I don't know that that's been addressed. Yeah. No, okay. I'm looking around at my team, and no, that is not explicitly addressed in the charter. So that's something I think we, we have to take a look at. Okay, and then the next one is how many rep – this is actually a couple questions, and I think we've answered parts of this. Um, but the initial question is how many representatives will be selected for the Science Standing Committee? Um, and then the second question was about selecting a diversity of members to represent a broad spectrum of sciences supported by NSFGO, and I think we've answered that part. Well, a little bit, I think, mm -hmm. maybe. But when you say representatives... Um, so the first is how many will be selected for the science standing committee? Okay, well, and I'm not quite sure I, uh, what, that, what that's referring to, but anybody who signs up to become a member can join any, any of the standing committees. The standing committees will elect their own internal leadership. They have to have at least a, a chair, or they could have co-chairs or multiple positions, but each standing committee elects, selects somebody who will serve on the leadership council. I think most people have expected that the chair, if there's a chair or, uh, well, if there's co-chairs, but the chair or a co-chair will serve on the leadership council. So each standing committee has one representative on the leadership council. So I didn't know if representatives meant representatives of the community within the standing committee. Okay, there was another part to that. What, what, what was the, there was a second part to that, did I cover that? Um, the other question was just in regards to selecting a diversity of members to represent oh. the broad spectrum of sciences supported by NSFGO. Right, and so is that elected within, within the standing committees or within the Leadership Council. Uh, the, the draft we have right now in the Leadership Council, uh, we've got a proposal in there based on feedback since the all-hands meeting to let each of the at-large uh, positions be allocated to one of the four uh, science communities. Within the standing committees, they have the ability to have broader uh, allocation of their leadership positions. So they might have, the Stein Sandy Committee might say, hey, we've got these same four kind of communities. We want some kind of a leadership structure within the committee to make sure there's representation from all of them. So say if, if it happens that the, the Oceans community, you know, really signs up and, and overwhelmingly dominates the membership of the Science Committee, do other sciences feel like, oh, they've elected the leadership and it's all out of their community. There's, I'm not really, I don't have a place here. So that's one of the things we've asked the, the committees to look at is how they want to structure internally to make sure that they have good representation and, and broad involvement of all of their stakeholders. Um, and then one final question, and this question is, is representation of the two-year community and technical college academic communities desired? I would say yes. Uh, NSF in the last year has been, uh, I think, very vocal about saying their target is the academic geoscientists, uh, but that doesn't necessarily say only four-year colleges or uh, tier one graduate school research universities. So. Um, I think the academic geosciences is their core constituency. Uh, so, but it's something we could bring up and just ask, and we'll follow up with NSF and just see how, you know, we haven't talked about it explicitly, but just say if that's their understanding as well, if we're correct. Okay. So any other uh, written questions here? I think that was it. I just want to do one reminder to everyone that there is a link in the chat box that we are asking that everyone sign in to this webinar. And if you are interested in 
um, working on one of these committees or teams, you can select which one you're interested there. That will help us keep track of who's interested in what so we can make sure you get all the information you need. Right. And also, one other announcement that um, these slides and this webinar will be posted on SlideShare and a recording will be posted on YouTube um, in the coming days. With links from the earthcube.org website yep. so you can find all of these. And if um, there's anyone you know who would like to come, who would like to know more about this, who has not, wasn't able to make this one, we will also have a repeat of the same webinar. We'll hold it on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 Pacific. Um, and just remind you that if anyone does have any more questions, feel free to chat. Right. You can them. either put them in the chat or we'll open it up if, if you want to, uh, okay. you know, uh, make it oral. Uh, yep. Can we unmute? Uh, we can unmute your hand? Or yes. just ra raise you your can hand. Raise your, there's yeah. a function you can raise your hand or if you can unmute yourself one at a time, we can take some questions. Sure. We've, got, uh, we've got a little bit more time, so mm -hmm. if there's anybody else who has a question you'd like to bring up. And I'm looking around my team while we're waiting, while people may be formulating some other questions. Was there anything we missed or anything that uh, that I didn't cover or didn't cover completely? Looking around? I think it was covered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Lee, this is Jim. Hi, Jim. Hey. So, I think it's important to reiterate that this first uh, sprint is to test everything and that nothing's written in stone. Good point. Yeah. And really for for example, this notion that all of the you know that the standing committees could potentially have ten thousand members. We'd love to have that problem, right? <laughs> If, if everyone volunteers. So the the issue, I think, is more probably going to be more how we're going to reach out and get more people. But we, the idea in this first, in this test phase was not to have any rules other than you have to sign up at Earth and see what happens, right? But that's not, that doesn't mean what that's what's going to happen going beyond the test phase if people run in the test phase determine that another approach is more uh, pertinent. Thanks for that, that clarification, Jim. Appreciate that. Yeah, the uh, uh, once somebody's described these these standing committees as maybe more like divisions within a professional society, so that you've joined the division of you know, on the science side or on the technical side. Uh, so we're calling them standing committees. But uh, you're right. If if we have hundreds or even thousands of people sign up. That's, that's kind of cumbersome for a, quote, committee structure. But uh, that's the kind of success I think we, we'd love to have in the committees then have the ability to structure themselves the best way to, uh, to handle that. And hopefully we've got the support in place to make that happen. And new committees may evolve out of this process. These are the two the community felt we start with. Um, as this process moves forward, new committees, new standing committees can be set up. Subcommittees can be set up. Uh, so we're trying to give it the, the minimum framework to make it work and enough flexibility that uh, the, the community uh, can be, re or the organization can be responsive to the community needs and desires. And this, this is clearly recognized by NSF as a, as a demonstration, as a test over the next year. And at the end of the year, we're going to be evaluating how well did it work, uh, what changes do we need to make? Uh, what recommendations can we give them uh, that would be more effective? And they can they can decide then uh, if if we're far enough along that they're ready to say, yeah, let's make this more permanent. Put a funding solicitation out, and at that point, they may ask for ideas on how to fix any weaknesses or make it more effective, or give some guidance on what they think needs to be done to make sure that uh, moving forward long term. So this really is a year-long experiment, and the major test case is to see if we can help the community converge on a system design, a system architecture um, that would integrate uh, all these different elements uh, under cyber infrastructure for the geosciences. 
Okay. Any other questions come in while we were chatting? Yes. We had one other question, and that is, how will the dates of the steering committee virtual meetings be announced? Um, and I think I can answer that one. Part of the reason why we are asking everyone to sign in as they come into this webinar is so that we can keep track of who is interested in participating on which committee or team so that we can then reach out to all the interested participants and try and find the best time to accommodate as many schedules as possible to hold a, an initial webinar for each of these groups in the coming weeks. We'll also post the times on the workspace uh, as well as announce them in our newsletters. Right. So we're going to try to get them out uh, as widely as we can, but uh, but we may not be able to hit everybody. So we're going to we'll do the best we can. If you have any other suggestions on things we could do to help spread the word, uh, we're, we're we're eager to hear them. Any other questions coming in uh, verbally from uh, from our uh, participants? Okay. All right. Well, I think that was a good set of questions. Uh, it, it's, it helped us recognize a couple of things we still need to do, a couple of things we need to talk with uh, our advisory council, uh, our membership, and uh, the NSF folks to resolve. But we're hoping to do that in the next week or so here. Uh, get those in place. But So let me just thank you all for participating. Really good discussion and questions. Uh, please let your colleagues know that we'll do this again on Monday. Uh, and if you want to come back with additional questions, we're, we're open to take them uh, at any time. Just I think we have a spot on the website where you can uh, submit something, or most of you know one or more of us on the team, and so you can always contact us directly. But we hope you're all going to sign up for EarthCube and, and get involved and bring uh, all of your, uh, your great ideas uh, uh, into the forum with us. But with that, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to working with you um, in the EarthCube governing structure here over the next year. So at that point, I'm going to go ahead and turn to Rachel and I see her nodding that we do have some questions already coming forward from the chat box. So let's start going through those, and then as we get through those, then we'll open it up if there's any uh, verbal questions. So if you have questions or comments, <coughs> add them to the, uh, to the chat box. But uh, Rachel, what, what was the first question that came up? Okay, the first question is in regards to um, changing committees, and this is so the scenario here is let's say that I've signed up for the liaison committee, but after this meeting I feel that another committee would be a better fit. How do I change the what committee I'm interested in? And related to that, the second question is can I be on what more than one committee? And I can go ahead and answer this first question in that if you decide that another committee might be a better fit for you, if you can go, you can feel free to take that survey, the little sign-in survey that I'm adding to the chat box now, and you can express interest in a different survey and we can make sure you get, or in a different committee, and we can make sure you get information on all of the ones that you're interested. And then the second question, I'll go ahead and let Lee take this one, and that's can I be on more than one committee? Yes, and I think uh, we're, we're working on the, um, the Set of uh, the report from all of this to NSF right now. In fact, we had a meeting earlier this morning, and we were going through the language on that. And I think we were clarifying that to indicate that uh, there was actually language uh, proposed, formal language that uh, talked about not only can you serve on it, but there's there's advantages to serving on multiple committees because it helps bridge the communication, uh, uh, linking the science and the tech excuse me, technology side and bringing your expertise to bear. So, yes, you can. And, uh, in fact, a lot of folks feel uh, we should be encouraging uh, a, a lot of that. So, next question. The next question is um, some more clarification on the funded team. Specifically, um, what is the science-funded team and who is on it? Okay. Those are the projects that have been funded by NSF right now under the EarthCube program. There's approximately 15 or so projects that are funded. 
I think um, 10 uh, are building blocks, so technically technology oriented. Three research collaboration networks, which are uh, domain communities get together to try to get their community cyber savvy and up to speed. Two concept design awards and the one governance award. So those are the funded teams. We're expecting another dozen or so projects to be funded here momentarily, and those will be added. So among those, uh, probably the largest number are technology-funded teams that are the uh, building blocks and the design teams. The research coordination networks are primarily the science-funded teams. Our next question is, in terms of engagement and liaison efforts, what are their plans for EarthCube to present at AGU and AMS meetings this December and January? I would say yes. Uh, we have funding in place, and the plan is to continue to bring exhibit booths to um, those the, the major national meetings for the elements of uh, the Geo Directorate and the Cyber Directorate. So we've been doing the Geologic Society of America, American Geophysical Union fall meeting, um, American Meteorological Society, uh, the Ocean Science meeting was in Honolulu. So we had exhibit booths at all of those. There were also either talks or posters uh, bringing people up to speed both from the governance side and EarthCube overall, and then I think people from the funded communities, funded projects, I should say, were giving EarthCube presentations at all of those, and we're planning on doing all of those. We're also looking at whether uh, there are additional uh, meetings like that where we should have an EarthCube presence and make sure that we're, we're keeping everyone informed. Right. And then our next one is in relationship to the or in relation to the engagement and liaison teams. And first, the comment is that um, it seems that the engagement and liaison teams should not just be the workhorse of the leadership council, but maybe this should be more of a two-way street like the standing committee and tech teams. So there is direct feedback to the leadership council on how best to accomplish the engagement and partnerships. Um, and then this is perhaps um, this questioner just misunderstood the structure, um, and is it that the engagement team is involved in the discussions with the leadership council? Uh, okay, and uh, I'll take the blame for maybe misstating that or not clarifying it, but I think absolutely I agree with you um, that it's a two-way communication, um, that the uh, they're, going to, they're the experts. They're going to help define what do we need to engage, who do we need to engage, how can we be most effective, effective with it. Leadership Council empowering them, getting uh, policy and, and uh, direction from the, com from the community uh, through the standing committees, but also getting out to these as implementation bodies, but turning them to them for saying, what kind of feedback, how's it working, give us some guidance on what we need to do to be effective. So. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I think we agree with with uh, what you were implying there or what you were stating. No. And just uh, another point of clarification on that: um, the images that we showed of these structures um, on this slide are, as of you know Friday, they are a little out of date in <laughs> the the image that we're using. So we are yes. doing some rapid redesigns of these and have cleared up our new images to ah. more. Um, call out those relationships more explicitly. Right. These, these are still uh, in draft form. I should have mentioned that. We're still experimenting. We've made a lot of changes in this to, to try to clarify what l visually the in interpretation that people take away. And, and we've had, it's been really interesting that uh, people on the computer science side look at a diagram and come away with very different interpretations than people from the uh, domain sciences we've discovered. And so some pictures automatically raise uh, visions of a layered architecture with certain roles and responsibilities inherently in it that others looked at and said, no, 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 that's a foundational layer and uh, doesn't imply that at all. So we've been trying to tweak the diagrams uh, to avoid cultural bias <laughs> that we're seeing. Uh, so it's, it's still a bit of a challenge. We're working on it. Okay, and our next question is in regards to precise processes and procedures. Um, specifically, what is the precise procedure for, one, putting forward candidacy for the Leadership Council, 
2, giving the candidates visibility among the voters in EarthCube community, and 3, the voting process. Um, when, is it, when is this planned and how will it work? Wow. And I'm not sure we have answers to all of those at that, that level of detail right now. Um, uh, I believe, and Rachel, correct me, um, on, when you uh, go on and, and express interest right now, do you have the ability to express interest in, in being a candidate for the Leadership Council? Yes. Okay. So you can do that right now. Uh, you can either nominate somebody or express your own personal interest in doing that. Uh, we've got a broad timeline right now showing when we're hoping to do this, but our plan is to uh, be working on that this week and come up with a more detailed uh, timeline on the nomination process and uh, uh, and we expect and and this we uh, I don't think we've discussed this explicitly in the team, but I'm expecting that we will have candidate bios or allow the candidates to make statements about uh, their qualifications or their their level of interest. Uh, we're trying not to impose too much of that structure. At this point, because we're expecting a leadership council, we'll have their own nominating committee or elections committee. There's some discussion on the na nature of that. But they will have, let's call it an elections committee, uh, that will set uh, the uh, procedures for that. So we're being trying to be careful not to impose too much from the project level here on that until the leadership council well, I shouldn't say until, but once the Leadership Council is in place, we expect they're going to establish their own uh, kind of guidelines and rules and, and procedures. So we're, we're walking a little bit of a fine line there. We don't want to have something too prescriptive in that, that, uh, that the Leadership Council will feel they need to dramatically revise. So you can tell I'm dancing around that a little bit. We don't have all of those details in place, but I think we have some ideas. I give it another... By the end of July, we ought to have all of that pretty well defined and posted online with the details. Uh, yeah, Rachel's nodding yes, so if you didn't didn't hear her nodding, <laughs> yes, she's agreeing that we, that's where we are going. Okay, and then um, this one is kind of already answered this one, but I have already signed up for X committee or team during the meeting or previously. Um, what comes next? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think, yeah, we have kind of covered it here, but we're going to be putting out a more formal, detailed timeline and step-by-step -step, um, and announce uh, dates for uh, the first uh, virtual organizational meetings, informational meetings for the standing committees, uh, the draft guidelines to under which the committees will get up and running, and they can add more to that, and lay out a timeline for selecting leadership within within those committees. Um, again, all of that should be coming out in the next one to two weeks with those details. So anybody who's signed up, indicated an interest about this, you will be contacted. So uh, you'll get notice from us uh, of all of those dates and the timelines and what steps and what's, in, what's going to be necessary to, to participate and how you can participate. Okay, and then our next question is coming specifically from one of the Building Blocks teams, and um, it says that we are organizers of technical sessions at AGU, which are very relevant to EarthCube. How do we coordinate these with the office? Oh, good. Um, let Rachel know uh, what we've been doing at, the, at all of the meetings we've been going to is uh, trying to make sure we've identified any EarthCube-related talk. We post it up on the EarthCube website. We've also uh, been doing flyers and brochures at the meetings uh, and a poster. So if you come by the booth, you can pick up a flyer. Uh, it'll say, here's all the EarthCube-related talks, all the activities, the town halls, posters, whatever's going on at AGU or GSA or AMS. Uh, what's EarthCube-related? times, dates, locations, all of that stuff. So anything uh, that you can let us know about, make sure that we haven't missed it. But we're doing that, I think, for all of the meetings. Okay, and then moving along, um, is there a max size to each committee or team in mind, or is this, or is the number unlimited? 
the community said let it be wide open, so no maximum size. Size. Um, so it could be that we're going to have hundreds of members of standing committees, with the exception, uh, and they're open to all, with the exception of council data facilities, which is institutional, and they've developed their own charter, which requires specific uh, qualifications uh, of being a facility or center to be a member. But otherwise, the the two other standing committees are unlimited right now in size. There is the possibility that new standing committees uh, will pop up. Uh, the Leadership Council can, can form those. The community uh, may recommend those. Uh, but these are the two that the community said, let's start with. And they were very explicit um, in defining the initial uh, document that it be wide open to anybody who wants to participate. Um, our next one is, oh, where did it go? Okay, here it is. What if, in, what if any role is planned for projects that have overlapping goals, e.g. funded by geoinformatics, sustainable software elements, et cetera, but are not directly funded from EarthCube? Perhaps a category of affiliated projects can be created. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think there is a recognition that we've got to have that interaction and relations, but I think you've just defined something there that we I don't think we've explicitly laid out in the structure because we've talked about reaching out to uh, uh, projects and programs funded by other agencies, by uh, private sector and internationally, but within NSF, uh, other cyber infrastructure, and you've identified a few other projects there. So I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. And just offhand, I could see that maybe there's another uh, uh, committee there, which is uh, not just the EarthCube funded projects, but uh, NSF uh, funded projects that are related, but don't necessarily have the same obligation that an EarthCube project has. Uh, the first round of EarthCube funded projects didn't specifically or explicitly state you have to design and build your project to be interoperable with the other other projects that are out there. We understand NSF in their negotiations for the second round is talking to projects and and uh, telling them that you need to build time and resources in to make sure that what you're building is going to be compatible and and integrated with other elements of EarthCube technology that are being built, and that they may add that language into the next solicitation. That that's one of the requirements that uh, design what you're doing so it's going to be part of this uh, greater infrastructure. But seeking uh, voluntary collaboration with other NSF-funded projects makes a lot of sense. So we'll bring that back to the table with the, uh, with the uh, project team here and with our NSF program officer and talk about how the best way to integrate that. Mm -hmm. But I think that would, that's a really exciting uh, concept that I think we've kind of maybe stepped over and didn't realize uh, that. So thank you for that. Okay, um, the next question is, will these draft governance structures be available after this meeting? Yes. Um, all of these, the slides uh, are, are already up on the website. And everything we do uh, is posted uh, on, in various places on the earthcube.org website. So we're in the midst of, of revising some of these diagrams in consultation with uh, the Project Advisory Committee, with our Operational Management Group, and with the NSF Program Officers uh, to make sure that we're capturing uh, the community input correctly. Or in some cases, we found there's been some uh, things that are, that are uh, seemingly contradictory or uh, confusing. So we've had to work through and try to reconcile what was the intent of the community here and go back through. Uh, uh, a lot of the notes and, and see if we can capture it correctly. So uh, as we get these things done, as soon as they're done, uh, we post them online. And then our next question is, who decides on the merits of a working group proposed by the EarthCube members at large, um, i.e. one that is not part of a standing committee or another structured body? Right, and those are brought forward to the leadership council, I believe, directly. I don't think they have to be run through a standing committee. Um, I'm trying to remember, actually. 
Uh, was there any requirement? No, because some of these may be cross-disciplinary. They may uh, cross uh, boundaries among the different standing committees. So a working group proposal can go directly to the Leadership Council and they will sign off. They may turn to a standing committee or all of the standing committees and ask for a recommendation uh, or, or uh, guidance from them, but uh, it is a decision of the Leadership Council. Okay, and our next question is, has a specific working group been assigned to handle creative services like data visualization or managing outreach to the scientific community? Um, I'm aware of three groups of people working, developing working group proposals right now. I don't believe either one of those topics would be covered by the working groups that I've heard of. Now, there may be others. Um, the ESIP meeting was just held last or two weeks ago in Colorado. There were a lot of EarthQ participants there. Uh, one of the building blocks there, it turns out their entire team was there and they had a, a, a project meeting there. But we had a lot, of, a lot of sessions, a lot of discussions. There were a lot of uh, conversations in the hallways and during the breaks among people getting together and uh, starting to put ideas together for working groups. So there may be things bubbling up that I haven't heard about. And then it looks like our chat is slowing down a little bit here. So this is our final one from the chat. And is there a good space as of now for EarthCube-related publications or peer-reviewed papers? It seems necessary to publish some of these to gain visibility among scientists, but um, can't really think of a single journal that might be suitable. Any thoughts on that, Lee? Well, so wait, wait. I'm not sure if I followed it. A journal that would be suitable? for this, or I thought the, yeah, the question so like, was, is there a space on the website where we would be listing references or links? Well, or? in answer to going that direction, we have we do have um, all of the papers that we have, either um, documents that we've created from test governance or the previous white papers and expressions of interest, those are all available on our, on our document repository via our website, but I think that the Larger question is um, right, more published papers. You know, if there's, there, we've got 15 funded NSF projects out there, so they're going to be generating reports and published papers and peer-reviewed journals and and other places. Uh, we should be gathering those. That's part of, I think, the science success story concept that the uh, the assembly workshop said in the all hands meeting said we need to be gathering those success stories looking at how we can use those uh, to engage the community and what we can learn from them. So if we don't have a repository already set up, we will definitely set one up on the website. As Rachel mentioned, we're already, all of the reports that are coming out of the projects that are more like project-related reports, but I don't know if we have one that, uh, uh, I think we could do this for both for abstracts, mm -hmm. for published papers, for linkages, for, um, or maybe some great literature reports that might be coming out as well. But yeah, let's make this a repository uh, catalog of all of the EarthCube-related uh, materials coming out. And so some more specifics to this question is, um, do you know specifically which peer-reviewed journals might have carried um, mm -hmm. papers related to EarthCube? Um, haven't seen anything in geoscience, yeah. cyber infrastructure, um, or other cyber infrastructure journals. Right, and I would say the timeline is such we probably haven't seen much in the peer-reviewed literature coming out. I think what I've seen have largely been abstracts from annual meetings, things like that, or reports to NSF or project reports that really haven't been aimed at, at formal publication. Um, you know, all of the, the funded projects really all got started about nine months ago or so. Prior to that, it was um, uh, these working groups, concept papers, concept designs, roadmaps that were reports to NSF but aren't necessarily well suited for uh, scientific publications. They were more uh, kind of planning and strategy documents or state of the art where we need to go. Um, so I would suspect we're just at the point where those are coming out of the community and going through the review process right now. So we uh, definitely want to make sure that we have an invitation 
out there on the website to the community, hey, has these come out or as, as you publish these things, let us know. Make sure that we're capturing them and, and you get recognition and, and we see the pieces that are coming together that are going to be creating EarthCube here. Um, and I think that's about it for our chat question. So if there's anyone on the phone who has questions, um, everybody should be muted now. But if you can maybe unmute one at a time, we can take some right. questions from so callers. Raise your hand or unmute, and we'll take any uh, oral questions that you have here for a few more minutes. I know we're also coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, that you all committed to, so we don't. We, we want to make sure we cover all the questions, but uh, also realize that people have other obligations. No. Okay. I'm not hearing anything. It was a good set of questions. So if, if, you're, good if you're still thinking about a question or trying to put your thoughts together, I, I will say, uh, excellent set of questions mm -hmm. here, and if you provoke us into Realizing there's a couple of things we've missed here, it's really exciting opportunities. Okay. Well, great. Well, um, then let me go ahead and thank you all for joining us today. Some excellent, excellent questions and generated some, uh, I think, some some new thinking on our part. Uh, we are planning on holding this webinar at least one more time. We've heard back over the weekend. Uh, that uh, uh, from some folks who just found out about it last minute, couldn't arrange their schedules, and it, it also indicated that there's probably a, a larger community that hadn't been uh, getting all of the, the notice that we'd like to get out. So uh, we're going to be trying to schedule another version of this uh, later today, or later today we're going to try to find a time to schedule it in the next week or so. Uh, and we also expect to have more details coming out, as some of you asked about specific dates and procedures for uh, participating and, and uh, volunteering for leadership roles or taking on some kind of a more active role within the EarthCube governing structure. So we'll be getting those out. Watch the website, follow the Twitter, Twitter feed, check us on Facebook, uh, and we're, we're trying to get the word out, but uh, it's a big community and uh, it's hard to, uh, uh, to, to try to make sure that we get hold of everybody. Any other last-minute uh, questions or comments coming forward? Um, there's just some actually some good side comments about um, publications in journals that I'm keeping an eye on, and okay. all of you having those comments, I will um, relay those to Lee and the rest of the governance team as well. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and uh, you can always follow up with any of us through, uh, if you have our emails or through the earthcube.org website with any additional questions or comments, uh, uh, feedback, we'd love to have it. So again, we appreciate you being here. We look forward to working with you over the next uh, couple of months as we set up EarthCube and, and get this demonstration governance going and, and see if we can actually build this system. All right. With that, thank you all, and, and we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this one up. And Rachel, do we have any questions in the chat box? It's actually been pretty quiet with this group today. Okay. Um, so just a couple housekeeping items. Um, I, put, I pasted links to the expression of interest form, so if you are indeed interested in participating in one of these committees and have not yet done so, if you can go ahead and fill out that form. We can make sure that you are copied in on all of the communications moving forward. Um, additionally, I pasted the link to the working group initiation form in the chat box. Um, it did get a little broken in there, so if you copy and paste that into your browser, it should take you there rather than clicking on the link hyperlink directly. Um, and then just one question about, um, we mentioned that several special interest groups are forming or formed, um, and are they listed under the interest groups on the workspace.org, earthq.workspace.org yet? And they are not yet. Um, we're still collecting those forms and um, processing them, so they have not, we have not reflected that yet. Okay, and let me make sure I understand. There, uh, I, I thought I was talking about working groups. Maybe I said special interest groups. There's a number yeah. of groups. 
Okay, there's both. There have been a number of groups, and we've met with, I think, three or four different uh, groups or representatives um, who were putting work group proposals together, more formal proposals, and we're asking when those could be brought forward. Uh, that will probably be officially after October 1st when the Leadership Council initially is set up, the office staff is in place, and they would be able to start reviewing those proposals and allocate uh, what resources uh, may be needed and make sure that they're officially approved. The special interest groups are uh, really much less formal, very informal. You can pretty much form those, I think, uh, now, anytime, start talking. We have a number of special interest groups that have already formed over the last year under the EarthCube umbrella that are meeting and, and have a space on the earthcube.org webpage. Mm -hmm. And the expectation is many of those will just continue forward, we, we anticipate, uh, as the test governance body actually gets up and operating. So I think that's simply going to be the people who are in it just saying, we'd like to continue forward, and, and that's all that's going to be involved. We'll make sure that they have a space online, they're identified with contacts available. Um, and then we have another question, and that's where can I get a copy of today's presentation? Um, I will, I believe that we have a version of this up from one of our previous webinars um, on our SlideShare, which is slideshare.net slash earthcube, and I will verify that after this call. Um, additionally, we will be, um, since this is our third and likely our final call on this particular topic, um, we will be um, putting up a YouTube video that's a compilation of this presentation as well as the question and answer sessions from each of the previous calls. So that'll take us, it takes us a little bit um, of time to get these rendered. Right, and I think uh, from the previous two calls, we've been able to, I think, update this presentation a little bit, either with some modifications of slides or in the points that I bring forward. So I think it's gotten a little bit longer here than the original ones because uh, questions that were raised in previous calls, we've tried to address those in the presentation now, and it may be that we've been somewhat successful because I think we've had fewer questions this time around. So I think we've been able to uh, uh, describe some of the things that have come up in previous calls. Okay. Um, Any other? And that's actually all the questions from wow. the chat. Okay. Well, then why don't we open it up? If you've got a, uh, uh, a question you'd, you'd like to just bring in on, uh, on the phone or on the uh, on the WebEx, go ahead and just unmute yourself and uh, and speak up. Uh, maybe if you're thinking about that for a moment, uh, uh, Rachel, is there anything that you think I may have missed on here that that's come up before that uh, may not have addressed? Uh, I think okay. I don't think so. I think you, we got most of it covered. Yeah, I think we've we've been learning. Uh, and actually, some of the questions from uh, previous uh, calls have been extremely helpful because people uh, discovered a few things that we had missed, or uh, a couple a couple things we hadn't thought about. And we went back and back through the notes, or uh, and then talked with the team and with NSF, and were able to resolve that and clarify a couple points. So it's really been very helpful for us in the previous calls as well. Okay. Well. Any other, uh, no more questions? I don't think so. Any other questions from? Can you uh, the on the, on our screen? Can you can you bring up the box, the, the chat yeah. window to see if maybe? Oh, I'm sorry. I had the uh, I had the mouse and didn't realize it there. Okay. Or or not, not uh, maybe the box that shows if anybody had raised their hands or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Well. We won't keep you any longer. I know you're all extremely busy. We appreciate you taking your time and joining us today. Uh, good questions. And uh, we hope that you will go, if you haven't already signed up, to be a member in EarthCube. Go sign up right now. Let us know uh, what interest you may have in, in various teams or committees, or take a look at it and decide you can come back later. But make sure if you sign up, we're going to be able to contact you and let you know when the next uh, webinars and virtual meetings notices going out so that uh, if you want to play an active role, we want to make sure you have that opportunity. Uh, great. So, all 
right. Well, thank you all. We appreciate you joining us and look forward to working with you in EarthCube over the next year uh, in our demonstration governance and try to try to build this out and, and make it work for the community. So again, thank you all for joining and, and we'll be talking to you soon.